I now call this meeting, regular meeting of the Davenport Community School District Board of Directors to order. Would everyone please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Director Beck, would you please read our mission and vision statements? Yes. Mission statement. The Davenport Community School District is dedicated to growing excellence in academics, the arts, and athletics for every child by ensuring the highest quality education in an environment shaped by our diverse community, preparing our students to be lifelong learners and productive citizens. Our vision statement. Education that challenges conventional thinking prepares all students to compete in a global society and inspires our students, parents, staff, and community to answer the question, what if? Thank you. Director Hayes, would you please read the guiding principles? Yes, I'll be happy to. Opportunity. We provide abundant opportunities to empower students to reach their full potential academically, creatively, and socially. Collaboration. We foster an environment that allows students, families, and community stakeholders to come together for the betterment of our students, education, and future. Transparency. We share relevant and important information with our students, families, and the community to maintain open and productive communication. Thank you. Superintendent Schneckloff, would you please read the goals? Goal number one, to enhance student learning. It's focus for tonight. Thank you. Uh, we will move on to recognitions. Uh, the first recognition we have um, for our new school board member, W. Kent Barnes. Uh, Kent serves as the Executive Vice President of Strategy and Innovation at Augustana College, where he has worked since 2005. He was an extensive experience, has extensive experience in the field of higher education administration. Enrolling, enrollment management, strategic communications, fundraising, and strategy development. Kent possesses a unique blend of leadership, innovation, and deep understanding of the ever-evolving landscape of higher education. Kent has worked in higher education for more than 30 years. Known for his strategic vision and ability to build strong relationships, he has consistently guided institutions towards achieving their goals while fostering a culture of collaboration and excellence. He has a keen understanding of data-driven decision-making, which has enabled him to implement innovative strategies that drive enrollment growth, enhance student experiences, and strengthen institutional branding. Throughout his career, Kent has been dedicated to advancing access and equity in higher education. He has championed initiatives aimed at increasing diversity, fostering inclusion, and ensuring educational opportunities for all students. During his tenure at Augustana College, student Student of color enrollment has increased from less than 10% to nearly 30% and international student enrollment has grown from less than 1% to 15%. Kent and his wife Jenny moved to the Quad Cities in 2005 and reside in Davenport. They have three children, Martha, Sophie, and Ben. The Barnes children are all products of Davenport schools. Kent's involvement in the Quad Cities has included serving for more than a decade on the Board of Trustees at Rivermont Collegiate, serving in a number of roles at St. Paul Lutheran Church and providing strategy, advice, and consulting to organizations like Impact Life and Q2030. Kent grew up in Gearing, Nebraska and attended Gettysburg College in Pennsylvania and Regis University in Colorado. That was a mouthful. <laughs> Uh, and also, I just want to note that uh, Board Secretary Brenda T. did uh, give him the oath of office last week. So he is official. Right, you want me to do? This is the one you're waiting for. Yeah. <clears throat> Rule one of board meetings have a Davenport pen. I do. Thank you. Okay. Uh, up next, we will recognize Jabari Woods. I will turn it over to the superintendent. 
Well, most recently at the St. Ambrose graduation ceremony, they recognized one of our very own uh, Jabari Woods and honored him with an honorary doctorate degree. I would like to take a brief moment to watch the, the opening ceremonies for the St. Ambrose uh, <laughs> commencement ceremony. Now, I will say this video is 25 minutes long. We will post it in the notes if you care to see what I would consider a very profound speech. I watched it myself and I actually took notes on it and there are some very inspirational things in there. So I would urge our entire community to watch this video because it's outstanding. And it is a direct reflection of the man that's standing here. It's very thoughtful, very caring, very humble human being. As Jabari has, has me saying now, we're the most imperfect people trying to make the best decisions in the world. And Jabari, we are so thankful for you. Um, but first, let's watch, just watch a little bit of the ceremony of you being recognized. The authority of its charter, granted by the state of Iowa, St. Ambrose University, with the approval of the officers and trustees, confers upon Jabari Woods the honorary degree of Doctor of Humane Letters in recognition of his transformative approach to education and upholding of the principles of faith through servant leadership and community activism given on this 20th day of May in the year 2023. Thank you, Robert. I, I think about all of the things that Jabari does for our community behind the scenes and on, on the stage as well. Um, one of the things that pops out of my mind is the hope ceremony which in one of the times of need in our community, Jabari stepped up and organized a hope ceremony where we captured the, the thoughts and prayers and hearts and minds of our young children, put them in a capsule during a time when we needed help, we needed to bring our community together. And Jabari, you did that. And, and we all ha we'll link that video to that into our notes as well, because I think it, as you urge me to do all the time, go back and watch that video because it is a promise that we make that, we're, that hope is something that can't be taken away. And, and Jabari, that's what you inspire in all of us every day. And we're, we wanted to bring you here to give you a Growing Excellence Award because of the hard work that you do and this wonderful um, recognition from, our, from our, one of our local universities. That's quite the honor, Jabari. Thank you so much. Appreciate everything and glory to God. All glory to Yah. I'm so honored to be in this position, in this capacity. Um, you serve as superintendent and a board that leads with their heart and their mind. Um, I wouldn't have it any other way, and I can't imagine not having the time capsule hold with TJ there leading us and promise us hope. Davenport schools will never fail because we got hope. And so I'm so thankful and honored for all of you and to be in the presence of the board. And you watched my journey for the last 11 and a half years. And so thank you so much. Are there any uh, presentations? 
I request that we move 10.01 up to the pre from discussion up to presentation for tonight. Okay. Everyone good with that? I'm good with that. Go ahead. So we will move. We'll do the uh, discussion item 10.01 online learning. Thank you very much. We have some conflicts tonight and Mr. Driscoll's uh, fighting through it for us tonight. So thank you too for coming up and, and presenting this with us. We've been on a journey with online learning um, and that started through before COVID with some of our credit recovery things, but just like the rest of America, we're forced to learn a brand new modality of learning uh, out of nowhere. And so I brought our, our team together here today to present the work that has, has occurred in the past, where we are and where we're going. I, I, I do have to recognize that um, the addition of Ms. Seifer has been absolutely wonderful. She's, she's our head principal at Mid-City um, and she has really taken ownership of this and sees, sees the direction that we're going and has done a wonderful job. And I think about Mr. Driscoll in a time of when we were in a little bit of turmoil, really stepped up, picked the rope up and has never really set it down. So Ben, thank you for your hard work on this. We really appreciate it. So I'll turn it over to you, Mr. Driscoll. Thank you. Thank you, board members. And <clears throat> I want to echo the superintendent's sentiments. Um, without Principal Seifert, I don't know that we could put together and put forth the plan today that I'm really excited about showing, and not just Principal Seifert, and she will, she will be quick to share credit, but with her entire team. Um, it's been, a, to use an over, overused term, it's been a game changer, and I'm excited for that. So I'm going to give a little bit of an overview and then I'll pitch it over to uh, Ms. Seifert. We don't get along well, so we try and stay uh, as far apart as possible. Um, <clears throat> with that, um, we're gonna I'd like to start with the overview of what we have slated for next year for your consideration, and this is for discussion right now, and so we're presenting it, and we'll be open for questions and feedback. What I would just ask is whatever preconceived notions that anyone has around online learning, that we just take that for a second and push pause on it, um, we have been through a three, four year journey, um, and some of that comes with potentially some, uh, some feelings that are hard to dismiss. And so um, if, if you could just try to, uh, again, just put on hold any types of ideas that you might have, and then at the end, we are open to pushback, feedback, questions, and comments. So with that, um, this is what we have for an overview. And I'm going to flesh that out with the help of Principal Seifert here in just a moment. Um, I would be also remiss if we didn't call out uh, our math specialist, Mike Wells, by name. Without Mr. Wells, we wouldn't have got to the point that we could utilize Ms. Seifert's help. Um, he has been the thing keeping this in any way, shape, or form together. And he, like me, is not feeling well today. I think it just hit him a little sooner. Maybe we shouldn't have planned this presentation together. So uh, I wish he could be here because he is um, the linchpin to all that, and I, I, I needed to say that out loud. So here's a bit of the journey that some of you may or may not remember. So 1920, of course, is the COVID-shortened year. And at that time, you'll notice the content. We created it. This was when we came back after spring break. We created, or excuse me, the following, yes. It was Google Classroom. It was for every student, and that was the COVID shortened year. We came back learning some lessons. In 2021, we used a combination based on the grade level. I will never forget sitting in the kindergarten classroom at Monroe Elementary doing a observation, a formal observation for a first year kindergarten teacher who was trying to keep their students awake online when she was like, I see Benny, he's, sleep he's sleeping. Um, so that is what 2021 was, when we had our entire everyone online in a variety, and we did, we did a combination based on the grades, based on the level, again, to learn lessons um, from our best efforts and from uh, what we knew around virtual learning at the time. 21-22 is when we pivoted a bit and we created the family choice. And we created, because at that time, er, excuse me, 2021, everybody through hybrid learning and whatnot, everyone had to be a part of this in some way, shape, or form, with a few exceptions. There were some students through their IEP or whatnot that, was, that attended each day of school, but there were times 
um, most of our students were a hybrid. And so we used a variety of different, primarily ingenuity, but it was family choice. And we, we had developed some guide rails and literally in the summer, right before we were uh, ready to launch it, was when they, they removed any open enrollment uh, restrictions, anything like that. And so we, we, tr we loosely suggested those guide rails while we navigated this new world of school choice. And that was 21-22. And so you'll see additional information, loosely established success criteria and change window. We should put a big line in here because 22-23, this year we just came off of is when we started to turn the corner a bit. And so with that in mind is when we started saying, families, you can request and our success criteria and change windows, we're gonna stick to them. And so we started, and, and if you have any specific questions, Principal Seifert will be able to tell, help us with that. We started saying, nope, this isn't working right now. We're gonna need you to come back to face-to-face -face learning. What we are ready to present to you today is what we have slated for next, for this coming school year and then also our long-term vision. You'll notice that we're going from K-12 to what we're presenting today is going to be for 7-12 with this idea that we will grandfather any student out because as of next year, it will be for, excuse me, the year following, we are recommending it's for high school students only. So we're recommending for your consideration. That's a two-year plan. So with that, um, we are gonna flesh out some of those. Can you tell us more about 23, 24, and 24, 25? And that's what we'll do now, and I'll turn it over to Principal Seifert. So this year, we really spent a lot of time tracking success criteria and making sure we have the right students online who are successful in demonstrating success. So we spent the majority of the year really fleshing out that success criteria in what um, makes you eligible as an online student, but also keeps you online if you so choose. So this year we said you need to pass all of your classes to remain online or you need to have a history of um, success with online learning. So that could have been credit recovery. You've demonstrated some sort of independence that you can handle this um, responsibility. We can see credit recovery to be taken prior to uh, online learning just to make sure those credits are um, earned and you were not investing in something that you're not going to end up finishing. So then we went to, uh, we do track attendance daily. We had to do a daily attendance log. Students have to log in. Um, and then next year we're looking at, we're, we went from 555 online students throughout the whole year, not at any given point, but throughout the whole year. And we're gonna recommend to go down to 200. Um, we had 130 at the end of fourth quarter. We had 130 students meet passing every class. Um, and then we decided to give 30 more a probationary status who only failed one class. Um, so we're looking at 160 online from fourth quarter that we're recommending for those 200 slots for this upcoming school year. Our online students still participate in all assessments. Um, ISAS fast for our elementary, which no longer will be uh, needed. They'll still need to take that at the junior high, but ISAS are still required to come in and take it, ACT. So those all still apply to our online students. And then the supports that we offer our online students, because we don't want them to be untethered in the, the abyss of online world. Um, I'm responsible for kind of managing online world uh, with my team at Mid-City. So dependent on the class, there'll be an Edgenuity teacher. Uh, the hope is for that to sort of transition to a DCSD teacher. So right now we have two of those hired. Um, for those other content areas, we rely on Edgenuity. Um, and then we have an online learning coordinator responsible for outreach um, and to ensure engagement because we track if they have not logged in for seven days, we reach out to them. And then we offer a drop-in center for if you need help or if you just want to, you just need a space because something is too chaotic. We have a drop-in center at Mid-City. And then there, if there is a student with I-504, IEP, ELL, those right now are all held through their home building. Um, and we work very closely with the case managers to make sure those needs are being met. Online students can still participate in extracurricular or co-curricular activities. We wanna make sure we offer those for all of our students. So they just work through their home building to either sign up or when practice schedules are, um, but they're still eligible to participate in that. So that was very quick and we're gonna, we're gonna flesh out the table in just a second and, and open it up for questions. Um, what, I would, what I would like to point out on this budget sheet here is 
this, this idea of a transition, and Principal Seifert spoke to this. Um, what we are recognizing is currently we are paying Edgenuity for their content and for Iowa certified teachers to be the teacher of record. And, and we are, for lack of a better word, outsourcing that online uh, instruction and content and everything to Edgenuity. We recognize that we have that capacity within our district and there's so many benefits to taking that back and um, aligning it with our current content. With the long-term goal being, if a student taking world studies in a traditional Davenport community school district, if these are the standards in the order and this is the scope and sequence to meeting those standards, we want to take this year to flesh out our content to match with that, and then we can then take back the ownership of that. We don't have to pay for a teacher record. Right now we pay per student, per course. So if my son, Ryan Driscoll, was an online student and he had 16 courses over the course of four terms, we would pay for each of those, per student, per, per head. If and when we take this and we flesh out this catalog and it's self-sustaining, there's not a cost to that. It is the cost of the staffing for sure, but it's not on top of that. So what you can see right here is we took the FY24 per pupil allotment. So we took that idea of 200 students at a full-time load times the 7635, which is what it would be for that full-time load per student, per head, per credit, and it comes out to that 1 million, one and a half million. What we will do, <clears throat> excuse me, the per pupil and allotment, that's what we will gain from those 200 students, I apologize. The top number is the 7635 is our per pupil allotment, what we get from the state of Iowa. So that brings us into the black. Then we have to pay edge annuity, and you'll notice that will be estimated staffing cost, because right now we're saying, well, what if we do the core instructors? We have posted for a, a tell me, please. We currently have um, a math teacher and a social studies teacher hired, and then we're looking for ELA and um, science. Thank you. So this is this hybrid year where can we start to enact what we see for the future, and what if our staff use our con or use their content for now and start to teach that while we develop our content to where we don't need the Edgenuity instructors anymore? And you can see even with paying Edge for this, or Imagine Learning, who's the parent company, for this hybrid, for electives and for anything we can't, we can't uh, deliver ourselves right now, we still would have a net gain for this coming year. It would, not, it would be cost positive um, with the eventual goal being we would house all of the support that the students need in-house with our content, our teachers, our material. There is an option to still use the EDGE platform and that's what's gonna take us a little bit of time. In other words, the kids already know how to sign on to that, but we can take and manipulate the content. And that's all what we're gonna dig into this year. I'm getting a little bit in the weeds here. With that in mind, what I would do is I'm gonna bring it back to this so you can see this idea of 2324. The content is from Edgenuity. This is what we're recommending. And it will be delivered by both Edgenuity for credits that we are not able to uh, facilitate ourselves at the current time, and the DCS teachers, as Principal Seifert said, we have two hired already, and we have postings for two more. The idea would be the DCSD teachers would be those four. We're still gonna use the platform so as not to confuse our students. We don't want a student to, to pay the price for this, where they have to log on to EDGE for their elective classes and somewhere else for our classes. We're gonna make the, the uh, experience seamless for the kids, um, and it is family request, and as Breland told us um, we're going to stick to those. We're going to stick to those guidelines. She does have examples of times where someone didn't meet the guidelines, and upon digging further in, we said, "Wow, you weren't successful." And the principal said, "You should have seen them before online learning." So we dug into their historical data, and we're like, "Wow, online learning was a good thing." So let's keep them. So we're not so black and white that we don't even consider exceptions. Um, but there is there is the opportunity for that with the idea that the following school year, we would create the content, we would use our teachers, platform is to be determined. By that time, 
we would have grandfathered out our middle schoolers into high school only, and then you'll see the additional information is um, creating a self-sustaining program. With that, I would open up for any questions or comments, uh, feedback, or Um, before I go to anybody, I do want to notate for the rector that uh, Director Potts and Poshton are on Zoom, and I will ask them first if they got any questions, and then I'll go to the folks in the room. Director Potts, do you have any questions? I, can you hear me? Yes, sir. I, I I don't have any questions, but I really like it. I I really think, especially middle schoolers, K K eight, they they need to be in the classroom and get that experience. And I, I think this is, I support what they what these guys have put together. Okay, thank you. Director Poshton? I have no questions. Okay, thank you. Director Beck. Almost forgot. Um, I have a couple of questions. Um, so you mentioned that one of the things they have to do credit recovery before enrolling. Um, I thought credit recovery was for students who hadn't passed classes, but I know there are probably students who just would prefer online learning, right? And so if they're starting ninth grade, they may be successful, but they would like to do online learning. How do we accommodate that if they had not had to recover credits? Um, so that's, we, we really track their success. So for our incoming ninth graders who don't typically, who have zero experience online, we almost get like a, like a free quarter, not a free quarter, but we'll, we'll test you out that first quarter. You need to maintain those four classes of passing. So that success and that pattern, uh, cause we're bringing you back when you fail. Um, okay. If that makes sense. Yeah. Credit recovery, um, is also on edge. It's kind of two different sides. And so for our students who have failed, we don't want to pay for a class that we can offer you on credit recovery. So you need to complete that first and you need to show some independence before we're willing to put you on the other online side. Does that okay. Make sense? Yeah, that makes sense then. Um, and then, um, so I appreciate moving it towards high school students. Um, I think that's, probably not a bad decision. Um, I do wonder about, because junior high is kind of a period of a lot of social anxiety, whether you know there might be some students who have some issues and might do better online, um, but I trust that you guys are sussing that out for, and there's a reason that you didn't pick junior high. Um, but that kind of leads into my other question. So there are other online schools in the state. So how, by restricting this to just high school students, how is that going to affect our overall enrollment? Has it, do we know? Yeah, I, I could speak to that. Uh, we don't know. We don't know how this will impact us. We were willing to open it up K-12 in that 21-22 school year for that very reason is we, as Director Potts said, we believe strongly that our elementary and junior high students need to be in the building. And it, it was a pandemic and there was so many different feelings from family members about, I know my kid needs to be in school and I'm not willing to risk it from a health and safety standpoint. And so at that time we decided we're not, we're not gonna we're not gonna put those strict restrictions on. We feel pretty comfortable that this is not about a pandemic anymore. This is about the future of education. And as a team and as a cabinet and as a district, we believe our, kin our kindergarten through junior highs need to be in the building. I, just to give you sort of like a scope of how many elementary and junior high were, there were 20 max elementary K-6 students online throughout the whole year, and then 28 junior high, seven, eight. So it's kind of a small, sliver in comparison to our high school numbers, which were significantly more than that. Were those students being successful though? Um, I mean, maybe varying. It would vary. Okay. Um, yeah, it would vary. Okay. Um, I guess that'd be one thing I would want to keep an eye on over time. Um, <clears throat> because if we do find that we have, the, even though that's few numbers, those are still our students. You know, if they, if there is a cohort of students who really want to be online for junior high, you know, in the future, maybe that's, and we're losing them to 
you know, other districts, that might be something to keep an eye on. But as a whole, I appreciate you guys putting in the same testing standards, the same, like that's really important. And I agree, kids do need to be in the classroom as much as possible, especially in those early years. So thanks. Hang on one sec. Director Barnes. I just have one question and that is 200, is that a realistic assessment of uh, the number of online learners? Because you, you are sort of making a case for ROI on this and, and that return is dependent upon having 200. Do you, do you think that's a realistic number? So currently we're at 160 something that have demonstrated success right now in our, from that grade level. And we are, we are leaving that cushion thinking some of these ninth graders are gonna get into these really big schools and think maybe online learning's not for me. So we are beginning with the 160 in terms of the, the ROI. And so it also is what we're doing this year in terms of this experimentation year. Dollars are dollars and they come from somewhere and we're using our ESSER relief dollars to allow us for a year to, to confirm or deny if that 200 is the realistic number. Great, thank you, and very good presentation. Thank you. Director Hayes. I was sort of along that lines with the numbers, and I was wondering if it had anything to do with the cost due to the outsourcing of it, the 200. Could you repeat the question? I'm a little confused. Well, you're saying you have 160 that are eligible now, possibly 200. With that targeted goal, does that have anything with the fees for it associated with the outsourcing or just the number, like you said, with the success rate? It's based on the success rate, okay. yes. It, we were basing this on student-centered and recognized, to overly simplify, Director Barnes, if we're making 7,500 per student and it's costing us about four, that it, it, there's not a tipping point per se. Now, I'm overly simplifying because if it was you know, 15 kids, we can't, we can't staff our own. But we recognize we're starting at 160 students, which creates a cost positive scenario at our starting point. And everything from here would be in that direction. I'm sorry, Director Hayes, I don't know if that answered your question. Thank you. Um, I have two questions. Um, if we offer this program, which I'm guessing is going to come to us at our next regular meeting, so when I get done asking my question, I'll ask if there's any other information board members need. Uh, do you think, are there any other schools in our area that offer this, or is it just going to be us? I'm thinking about open enrollment. The surrounding schools offer a version, the, the surrounding districts. Now there are Iowa Online Academy, there are open enrolled opportunities where someone can just drop from us and say, I would like to enroll in Online Academy. Iowa Online, I believe that's the name, I can't say it exactly. So yes, there are other options. Okay, but we potentially have the opportunity to get those students to open enroll to us to do this. So currently, point of clarification, we are not an, you have to apply and be recognized as an online learning academy such as that. Mm -hmm. We couldn't, we could not enroll someone from Council Bluffs to us for this purpose. Now if someone was, came, open enrolled to Davenport schools, was in our schools, recognized that this is a, something they wanna take advantage of, that's, we could allow for that, but they can't come in for that purpose currently. Okay, that, that was more what I was getting to, if we'd be able to attract more students from and is there a way for us to do we're that? Hopeful. Yeah, okay. We're hopeful. Yeah, we're hopeful that's the long term plan. Yes. Okay. All right. Um, go ahead. Sorry. So, the Online Learning Academy, can you just differentiate? Like, uh, Director Gosa asked about the neighboring schools, and everybody offers some version of this. Can you explain are those any of those online learning academies? What's the difference there? It is Davenport, Benton, or whoever. Johnston, it would be, hey, we have online learning at our school for our students, a version of maybe something along the lines of here, but until you have been recognized by the state of Iowa as an online learning academy, you can't open enroll people in for the purpose of online learning. 
And I don't have a comprehensive list of who has and who has not, but that could be something that I could get. I think the closest one to us is Iowa City. Um, Iowa City is the closest one to us that is a registered virtual academy. No problem. And then my other question is, um, if uh, let's just say the the student goes to or lives in Central's boundaries, right, and they're doing this, are they tied to Central for their extracurriculars, or because we're open enrollment for high schools, could they go north or west or whatever? Or are they tied based on where they live because yeah. it's open enrollment? We haven't had a ton of students who want to transfer. If your home boundary is central and play sports at North, typically if your home boundary is central, they've stayed at central. I think that would op that would be open for conversation for our ILD, but primarily they stay with their home building. Okay. Past practice has always been also for ninth graders. Um, let's say they were going to attend mid city, they have the option, because they would have the option to transfer option um, to choose first time so let's say hypothetically a student um, ninth grade student chose to be online they would have to declare a home school to participate and then the rules in terms of transferring to a different school the 90 day sit those things would apply okay that that was what i wanted to know about the declaring what school you transfer. president goes could i add one thing to that uh we didn't mention here if a student at davenport central elects to take advantage of online learning, their enrollment within our system is a dual enrollment. So they maintain a foot in the door at Central, so they're still getting the e-blast, they're still getting the updates, they're still invited to homecoming, they're still, yeah, you, you keep your foot in that door and they're also part of the Mid-City. Um, so the Mid-City administrative team and the online learning team is the one facilitating all that, but we don't wanna, if a student's like, families that we're all blue devils and I really need online learning we don't want to sever that and say too bad about you so it's a dual enrollment okay so well, I'm glad to hear that they're gonna get the e-blast and everything like that um, is there any other questions director Potts or Poshin do you have any other questions I do not I do not Dan okay does anyone need any other information or want to see anything else before this comes to us at the director back? Um, just the fact that we're using um, <clears throat> SR3 for the transition year. What are the plans for funding beyond that? Just to recap. <laughs> no, that's fine. Yeah, we threw a lot in a short amount of time. We're using SR3 to allow for us to maybe play and be a little less conservative than we typically would with our traditional funds. That said, it will, assuming this goes the direction it will, it will be a cost positive. The key though is we would have to establish these guidelines, know the students that are going to be in online learning, and then we'd have to staff accordingly. So if every 30 students is an FTE at Davenport West, and you have 30 students that are exercised, then that's 30 less students, and that is one teacher. So it's not, it's not a punishment per se, but it's these students generate these dollars, and these dollars are gonna pay for those students' online learning. So it is, it is cost positive, and it is a self-sustaining, but it's not quite that simple because the enrollment is the piece. Anyone else? Perfect. Thank you for the presentation. All right, we'll move on to board reports. Are there any board reports? Director Hayes? Just wants to express the board condolence to the Eccles family in the loss of Antoine Eccles, who was a previous STEM board student. Thank you. Are there any other board reports? Um, the only thing I have is uh, Superintendent and I met with the Mayor of Davenport earlier today um, and talked about a few things. And then uh, we also last week with Brenda did onboarding for our newest board member to kind of give them an idea on how this stuff all works and how much time it takes. 
Go ahead. And we also learned a lot from Kit, Dr. Yeah. Barnes and that as well, that we're adding to our orientation. For example, he works with 40 board, board trustees. And we got some very good information. We're very impressed um, with the interaction. So thank you. And thank you for stepping up in this time. We're very excited. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, seeing no other board reports, I'm going to move on to communications, which I don't see any, so I don't have to read that big long thing. Uh, there were no uh, online open forum requests, correct, Ivy? Thank you. All right, so there's no communicate, no open forum tonight. Uh, we'll move on to the consent agenda. May I have a motion on the consent agenda? Mr. President. Director Hayes. I move the board accept the consent agenda as written. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by Director Beck. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, I'll call for the vote. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed, same sign. Eyes have it, motion carries. Superintendent report. Brenda T wanted me to alert the board that on November 15th through the 17th uh, at the Iowa Event Center, Des Moines, we are going to be having our IASB convention and trade show. Um, and she's going to be registering us for this. And I know if, uh, if I'm gonna channel my inner president Goza, that's when we, um, get up there and receive an award for the wonderful work that this school board does um, in, in terms of going to workshops and, and attending events and improving our boardsmanship. So uh, look forward to that event every year where we really grow as a board together. So Brenda wanted me to share that. Thank you. Committee reports, the data wall ad hoc committee. Well, as you can see, we have a little bit of progress moving in the right direction. We wanted to share some average airlines delay in U.S. domestic flights in 2008. So, Tim, thank you very much for getting this set up. Our, our wonderful uh, man in the closet over there, Mr. Mr. Tim Longoria, has put up and displayed our data for you. Uh, this is the system that was purchased. We are working hard towards putting the data that's relevant to us up there. But as you can see, it's a wonderful visual. Um, it's going to be very useful uh, for us um, and, and allow us to stay focused on what our goals are. Um, this system is immersive system, so it can be controlled by other laptops in here, and it can be also be utilized during the day when we have 100 people inside this room doing professional development, so it's, it'll serve dual purposes. Um, in terms of the content of that, uh, Diane Campbell, myself, and Courtney Olson are getting ready to really put the final presentation, the final push forward for this, where to where then we're going to invite um, Ms. Director Hayes to come and sit down so we can make a recommendation to the board on what should go up there. So pretty exciting content. Thank you. Uh, Finance Committee, Director Poston. We'll be meeting next week. Okay, thank you. Elziak? Nothing to report. <clears throat> okay, thank you. Uh, nothing to report on legislative advocacy other than they have a special meeting uh, they convene tomorrow. Uh, Long Range Facilities Planning, Director Potts? Uh, we have a meeting this Thursday at 2 o'clock. Thank you. Policy Committee? Um, we did not meet this month. Thank you. We will move on to items requiring action. May I have a motion on subject 9.01? Mr. President. Director Beck. I move the board approve the 28E agreement to join the Iowa local government risk pool and purchase natural gas for the annual amount of $600,265.21 for fiscal year July 1st, 2023 to June 30th, 2024 from Wood River Energy. Thank you, is there a second? Second. Motion's been moved and seconded. Is there any discussion? Okay. Oh, Director Beck. Um, my question just had to do with the start date. We had some discussion about uh, July 1st versus the end of our contract with Mid-American, I think. 
and I wasn't clear that that was resolved. But it, so I guess could you explain? We sent a letter to our current contractor, so our new one could start, and the current one would would stop. And there's no penalty for that. No. Oh, okay. Uh, Director Klein Jerome. Um, Josh, when you presented this before, there were three columns, three choices. Is this the third column? Yeah. That were, okay, thank you. Uh, Director Potts, do you have any questions? I do not. Director Poshin, do you have any questions? I do not. Thank you. Uh, is there any other discussion? Seeing none, I'll call for the vote. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed, same sign. Ayes have it. Motion carries. Uh, may I have a motion on subject 9.02 West High School HVAC upgrades general contractor? Mr. President. Director Beck. I move the board award the bid for West High School HVAC upgrades ESSER project general contractor to the lowest responsible responsive bidder, Crawford Heating and Cooling Inc., in the amount of $5,202,220. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. second. Motion's been moved and seconded. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, I'll call for the vote. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed, same sign. Ayes have it. May I have a motion on subject 9.03 West High School HVAC upgrades asbestos abatement? Mr. President. Director Beck. I move the board approve the contract with Terracon Consultants, Inc. for the West High School HVAC upgrades ESSER abatement project in the amount of $95,500. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, I'll call for the vote. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed, same sign. Ayes have it, motion carries. May I have a motion on subject 9.04, West High School HBAC upgrades equipment purchase from train. Mr. President. Director Hayes. I move the board approve the purchase of equipment for the West High School HVAC upgrades ESSER project from train in the amount of $2,896 thousand dollars thank you is there a second second motion's been moved and second is there any discussion seeing none i'll call for the vote all those in favor say aye aye, aye. aye. any opposed same sign ayes have it motion carries may i have a motion on subject 9.05 dcsd core diploma Mr. President. Director Klein Jerome. I move the board approve the DCSD core diploma graduation requirements as an option towards graduation for seniors to begin the 2023 24 school year. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. Motion has been moved and seconded. Is there any discussion? Director Beck. Um, yeah, I remember um, there was some discussion over <clears throat> how to if there was a distinction between this diploma that said, you know, I graduated with a core diploma versus, you know, according to the state of Iowa versus according to the full requirements of Davenport. Um, and if I remember correctly, uh, I think other districts who use this type of thing did not make it distinctive. Is that correct? No, that is not correct. Other districts, one of the districts even identified as an at-risk programming diploma so okay. they, they do identify it as a separate diploma okay. and then so do we have plans to do that as well at this time yes okay good is there any other discussion seeing none I will call for the vote all those in favor say aye aye, aye. aye. any opposed same sign Eyes have it, motion carries. May I have a motion on subject 9.06, 
social emotional learning curriculum adoption. Mr. President. Director Beck. I move the board approve the purchase of social emotional learning curriculum from Character Strong for fiscal year 2023-24 for $62,576.50. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. Second. Motion has been moved and seconded. Is there any discussion? Seeing and hearing none, I'll call for the vote. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed, same sign. Ayes have it, motion carries. May I have a motion on subject 9.07 UEN membership renewal? Yes, Mr. President. Director Hayes. I move the board renew membership with the Urban Education Network UEN for 23-24 in the amount of $10,750. Thank you, is there a second? Second. Motion's been moved and seconded, is there any discussion? Seeing and hearing none, I'll call for the vote. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed, same sign. Eyes have it, motion carries. May I have a motion on subject 9.08, policies for board approval? Mr. President. Director Klein-Jerome. I move the board approve the following policies, 102.02, Thank you, is there a second? Second. Motion's been moved and seconded. Is there any discussion? Seeing and hearing none, I'll call for the vote. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed, same sign. Ayes have it, motion carries. All right, we will move on to discussion items. The first uh, subject for discussion is 10.02, special education, compensatory education. Tonight, Courtney Olson and Program Director Aaron Rome are gonna give us an update on these two items. Good evening, Board of Directors. Um, as Superintendent Steckloff shared, we are here to give you an update on compensatory education within special education. So if you'll recall, the, you last received an update in January of 2022. Um, and at that point, this is the information that was shared with you. So for phase one, the compensatory education had been completed. So at that time, 315 students had received 6,538.17 hours of compensatory education instruction. For our phase two citation around alternative assessment, six students had remained, still needing a total of 632.88 hours. And again, in phase two citation for early childhood, three students remained needing a total of 239.08 hours of instruction. So that was the update provided to you in January of 22. Currently, we can report that all of the citation work has been completed. So that was phase two for the alternative assessment and for phase two early childhood. And then what's remaining is just some other non-compliant issues that we've uncovered over the years to make sure that we're doing right by our students. Um, we're awarding that compensatory ed as needed. So right now there are 11 students who have qualified for compensatory education with 10 out of the 11 students being done by the end of the summer. They're, they opted to get compensatory education throughout the summer. And so that's totaling about 325 hours of instruction. And then there are 10 students who will begin receiving compensatory education um, at the beginning of the fall, because they opted to begin it at that point. And so you can see um, 189 instructional hours there. And as we continue to want to improve practices, we know that we need to continue prioritizing professional learning for our special education teachers and leaders. 
We also, when we uncover things, if it's a specific issue, um, you know we're providing targeted support to that individual. And lastly, we're working on, we're continuing to work on our internal procedures manual to make sure that we are up to date and compliant. So that was brief, but that's an update. And so any questions? Director Kleindrew. Um, I'm glad to see that our phase two, we are completed, completed. Why do 11 students come up? We discovered. Why, how are we discovering it and why weren't they caught earlier? So these are just a variety of things. Some things included lack of para support. So as you know, we've had para shortages. And so just being able to provide some of the services in a timely manner in the IEP, we've awarded it that way. Um, extended teacher absences have occurred that we want to make sure that we're making up for that instruction. Um, some progress monitoring things. Um, some students with significant medical needs and there have been some hiccups with nursing. So things like that, we're just making sure that we're providing students what they're supposed to be getting. Director Beck. Um, along those lines, um, you know, no system is perfect. So is this kind of about what a typical district of our size would expect for continual monitoring? Um, I, ideally, we'd have no compensatory ed required, right. but, you know, there's not, nothing's perfect. So mm -hmm. it sounds like these are things that just not, that are completely unrelated to any of the citations that we got in the past, but other districts, do we know sort of how often or how much compensatory ed they have to award or they, they choose to award? Yeah, I, award? I can't speak to specific for other direction or other districts. And of course, there's no like ma magic perfect yeah. formula. Um, I would say when we sat down to review this and to identify the numbers that we're looking at and knowing a large portion are getting it completed over the summer and except the ones who wanted to start in the fall. Um, I felt okay with it and just, you know, proud that our teams are advocating for students and when we make mistakes, we own that and we make up for it, so. Okay, yeah. cool, thanks. Uh, Director Potts, do you have any questions? Yeah, um, I understand, I, if I heard correctly, that some of this is because of a, a lack of, of a para or paras in the classrooms, so I, so it is the compensatory education we're giving these kids a para for 10 hours? No, not necessarily. If the, so to be if eligible the, for if the shortcoming was a lack of a, of a para, how does that translate to compensatory education? So in order to qualify for compensatory education, you have to demonstrate that the student didn't make adequate progress in their goal areas and determine what was the service that was missing for that. Um, so just because a pair was missing doesn't mean you automatically get compensatory education. You have to review the progress of the student and the team has to make that determination. So in a, some of these cases, that, um, that additional adult, adult support was deemed as part of the reason why we're, they weren't making the progress they were needed. So then the team def defines, okay, what does that compensatory ed look like to help that student make the progress that they should have made initially? Does that make sense? Yeah, but what does it look like? I can't speak specifically for this case, but it could be additional instruction with a special educator over summer or after school or before school. Um, again, the team defines that. All right. It's, it just sounds kind of loose. It's a team decision. Did you have anything else, Director Potts? No, not at this time. I will say to that point, Director Potts, that that's why we're working on our procedures manual so that we, are, we do make sure we're all operating from the same uh, procedures as teams come to the table to make these important decisions. Director Potts, do you have any questions? Yes, how are the parents included in this process? So these are decisions that IEP teams make. So the parents are a required team member at those IEP meetings. So they would be uh, a primary person at those meetings making decisions about what compensatory education looks like. Okay. 
Director Poshin, did you have any other questions? No, thank you. Okay. Anyone else have any questions? Um, oh, Director Pinger. Okay, so uh, they did not make adequate progress during the school year. So now they're doing a summer school type thing to get these hours. And at the end of summer, they still have not made adequate progress. Do we owe them more time or then what happens? Well, since the team made the decision of what that compensatory education would be, if at the end of that service, if the team did feel that way, they could come back to the table and have that conversation. Um, I don't know many instances where that has happened though. Mr. President, Director Potts. Yeah, I just, what's the what's the cost of this? What's the what is the all this compensatory going to cost? So the cost would be paying the teacher outside of their contract um, to be providing the service. But what is the budget? What is the amount? Have we have we calculated that? We do have that. I don't have that in front of me right now. Okay, you share that with us on an email or something, okay? Okay. Hang on one second. Can you define who's all members of the team for everybody else that doesn't? I mean, we do have a new board member, so everyone knows. Yeah, um, no, thank you. Um, so required team members at an IEP meeting would be the parent, um, a general education teacher, um, someone that uh, can provide some guidance on what the curriculum looks like at that grade level, um, a special education teacher, um, and in some cases, if there was an evaluation done, someone that can interpret those results as well, and then, of course, uh, an administrator, or what we call a local education agency representative, who is often a, an administrator, oftentimes at the building level. And so compensatory education, too, is something that's in addition to the instruction that's already provided during an instructional day. So it's not supplanting that instruction, it's in addition. So that's oftentimes why parents might elect for that to occur during the summer, uh, because it's not extending like a long day for a child, because it would have to be before or after a school day, if it was during the school year. And an IEP meeting is a pretty labor intense process. I actually sat in on one one time just to see how it went. Uh, Director Beck and then I'll go to Director Pine. So um, this all falls under, in terms of uh, budgeting, this would fall into our special ed deficit, right? In terms of what the money, it comes out of our general fund, but we ask for the authority to spend it. We're legally required to spend it, right? Um, and then we ask for the authority to spend that when we go every year, right? So basically, yeah, it's a will, not a shall. Perfect, okay. Um, would, so if, um, you know, nursing issues or a shortage of paras or teacher absences are some of the reasons why we have to offer compensatory ed. Um, do you guys have any suggestions for what we could do at the district level to s try and prevent this from happening? Um, obviously salary is not something we can talk about, but are there things that we could be doing you know, in the next school year or whatever to prevent this from happening in the future? Again, no system's perfect. It might happen anyway. If there's not, that's fine. I just didn't know if there's like some things that, concrete things that could be done to try and prevent this. Yeah, I think as Ms. Olson mentioned too, is looking at our uh, procedures mail. We're, um, I'm working along with our special education specialist right now to one, provide some professional learning uh, so teams feel confident on how you can go about making those decisions. And also too, if we're aware of some of these, maybe we can be proactive on the front end. If it's uh, um, like a pair situation, if let us know ahead of time so that 
we can maybe do some troubleshooting before it becomes a situation where it's snowballing to be in a more problematic uh, issue that's pervasive. Director Pinedrum. Um, Jamie, are we paying $28 an hour for summer school instruction? No, they're getting $45 an hour. Okay, under. so if we took 325 hours times $45, it would give us a rough idea of what we're spending. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Any I, other, I, will, uh, I will add that to the Friday report. Thank you. Yeah. Any other uh, questions? I just one, one, I mean, th this is a legal requirement. I mean, some of this is, is inevitable. I mean, it is beyond our control. Um, and, and I mean, I think that's important to the, the discussion that, that when there is a legal requirement, and this is really complicated stuff, um, some of this is just inevitable as we try to serve our students. And, and just to add on to that, too, I think it's the diligence of IEP teams of when we can make things right that we're coming around the table as a team and doing right, or at least doing better in those cases, too. So you're right. It, it is um, a legal obligation, and I'm proud of those that have come to decisions where we need to owe up and provide what a child is required for service. Any other questions? Thank you for the presentation. I'm glad that a lot of this stuff has been cleared up. And just for future reference, anybody else giving presentations, when you say like teams and things like that, mm -hmm. give us a little more than that because the public hears all this stuff too, so they don't, so they just don't think it's a district team. Mm -hmm. So thank you, thank you very much for that. Thank you, sir. Uh, next subject is 10.03, textbook adoption for family and consumer science pathways. Allie's going to share the next two items with us for discussion as we plan to bring these forward for action so we can utilize these materials in the upcoming school year. Thanks for being here, Allie. Yeah, so um, family Allie, and sorry. will you just do a brief introduction of your job for Director Barnes? Oh, for sure. So my name is Allie Vandermind. I am the curriculum specialist for um, career and technical education. Um, specifically for this stuff, I also oversee PE health and concurrent enrollment within our district. And eSports. It's also really important. <laughs> um, okay, so specifically for this one, this is family and consumer sciences. Um, so this would be um, we're asking for uh, textbooks to cover all of the courses within our FCS pathways from middle school all the way up to high school. Um, so we, the team, and I'll define team, it, it was a team of teachers, um, got together in the month of June like we always do for Perkins Week um, and decided on one textbook for all of the early childhood pathway courses. I assure you that it is a very beefy textbook, but one of the things that we had talked about was ensuring vertical alignment across all of our courses, and one of the easiest ways to do that was to all use the same resource. Um, so all of the teachers, all four of them, five of them, um, because we have one who teaches at Children's Village, um, decided on this textbook, The Working with Young Children. It also includes online access. The culinary courses, so our foods, advanced foods and international foods, we adopted the guide to good, we would like to adopt the guide to good food, our capstone class for that is ProStart, and they have their own curriculum that we purchase every year for the ProStart classes. Um, and then the intermediate course, the culinary arts, uh, really liked adventures in food and nutrition. And like it says, we haven't updated textbooks since 2007, so we're just really excited to be able to get something new. Yeah, super easy. Director Beck. Um, so if I'm understanding correctly, the early childhood by choosing one very comprehensive textbook, we then can serve the same student through all of the courses that they're taking in terms of early childhood rather than having a different book for each. Yeah, 
So um, this isn't exact, but it's basically chapters one through five are the first class, and then six through ten are the next class. And kind of oh, upwards that way. Kind of like my AMP class. AMP yep. one is the first half of the book. AMP two is the second half. Yep. Okay. Um, and then uh, six years for the early childhood uh, pathway courses. I know early childhood education changes, like our understanding of it changes. Um, and if we're using books from 2007, I'm glad that we're updating them. Um, but I guess is six years like too long or is that kind of like a reason? I mean, we wanna make sure that a student can move through all the courses and we're not changing things all the time, but is that kind of a reasonable amount of time in terms of keeping it updated with the latest research in early childhood education? Yes. Um, we feel very confident about six years. They also publish new stuff online as a okay. part of that. So they publish a new unit every semester just to kind of keep everything updated. Oh, okay, to up as a supplemental update mm -hmm. or something. Okay, thank you. Director klein Um, Will this fit into the middle school model that we are going to be implementing? Mm-hmm, yep. And Perkins, can Perkins be used to purchase a curriculum or... The answer is both yes and no. Um, so Perkins Money can um, supplement but not supplant, but we're using ESSER to spend this money, which is a federal funding program. So if Perkins needs to come in, it can then come in at the end of six years because this is a federal funding. So like Perkins can come in and spend money where federal money. Do you want to answer that? I'm right. This is why they took the mic away from me. Yes. ESSER funds, almost rarely you ever hear me say this, but supplant, ESSER funds can supplant. That's some, for ESSER 2 and ESSER 3, the ESSER 3 that Allie's talking about is for this year, and we'll be completing ESSER 2 was done last month. Um, so yes, we can supplant this year. Everything that we're doing in ESSER for all this curriculum and so forth, the reason some of the cycles are being six years here and eight years there is because we're getting back on cycle with our curriculum, ado curriculum adoption. So we're not having to have all of it done at one time. It's just impossible to do. So all of the department is looking at that going, okay, in six years we'll do this, in eight years we'll do this, in seven years we'll do that. So they're, they're really honed in on the timing of everything. So yeah, yes, we can supplant. Where does Perkins fit into all of this? How can Perkins money be spent? Okay, so um, Perkins money is... Like I was saying, it can't supplant if we're using like our general fund. So as soon as we pay for something out of our general fund, we can never pay for it out of Perkins again. But because this is a federal funding, we're using ESSER in order to pay for it. Perkins can come in and then pay for it once ESSER runs out and we need to like re-up on these curriculums. And what other things do we spend Perkins money on? A lot. <laughs> that is a very long list that I'd be happy to work with TJ on if you want the whole thing. It's equipment, it's sending t CTE teachers to conferences, it's curriculums. We pay for several certification courses for both students and teachers, um, lots of supplies um, every year. This year we have about $286,000 in Perkins for this upcoming school year. And Thank every penny is allocated. Thank you. We can add that to a, Friday, a future Friday report if you want. Director Potts, do you have any questions? I do not. Thank you. Director Potts, do you have any questions? I do not. Thank you. First, that is an awesome shirt you're wearing. Oh, thanks. I really like that way to support the logo, the <laughs> brand. Um, these are actual physical textbooks, and then we do get the online version mm -hmm. as well. Yeah. So we have a class set of textbooks at each building, and then online access to fill out everybody having right. access all the time. I'm always leery of textbooks now because there's always a new version to upgrade them, but, and they take up a lot of space. They do. Where the Chromebook is just right there. Um, I'm assuming this is going to come to us at the next. Is there any other information that board members would need to be able to vote on this at the next regular meeting? Director Beck. How do we get shirts like that? <laughs> Fine, I'll wait till after the meeting.
Any other information board members need? All right. Uh, we'll move on to subject 10.04, textbook adoption for applied sciences pathways. All right, so this is our next one. Um, this would be automotive, construction, manufacturing, and welding are four of our 15 CTE pathways. Um, this one has not had an update since 2007, so we're excited. Oh, it was both of them, it was 2007. Um, okay, so we have Introduction to Diesel Mechanics wants to adopt the diesel engine technology. Again, with a class set of physical textbooks and six-year subscription, um, welding and manufacturing would like welding fundamentals. Um, and then the Construction Technologies 2 course would like print reading for construction, residential, and commercial. This comes with a full um, bundle with 200, 120 blueprints of various construction projects that they then have to read and analyze. Um, and then it includes also a class set of physical textbooks and online access. Um, it does say vendor one, you'll notice. Um, so these are the books that we want from Goodhart Wilcox. We also have um, another textbook adoption that's happening for the constructions one and three that's actually from a different vendor um, because they liked those books better. This is just the way the curriculum laid out. Are there any questions? Director Beck? Why does construction one and three have something different from construction two? Like, is there not a vertically aligned set of materials for that? So the construction one and three book was the first choice of the teachers for um, all of the construction technology courses. Um, however, this additional print reading material is that's what they're basically teaching in construction tech too. And they re like, they loved the bundle. They're like, we want all of the blueprints so they can mark them up. Cause right now they're just using like old blueprints that they kind of just find. And so having a standard set that all of them can be talking about and comparing and looking at. So it's more of a resource than necessarily a like full textbook. Have they, so, okay, that makes sense. It's a resource that's not available from the other yeah. <clears throat> textbooks. I would encourage them to contact the publisher of the other textbooks and say, hey, this is a resource that we use from another publisher. You guys might consider it. Yeah. It might have something to do with copyrights or something like that. But they can produce their own version of something similar. We can ask. It's not going to hurt to ask. I learned how to do construction. They handed me a set of tool bags and said, here, do your thing. <laughs> yeah, so I'm just saying. Um, any other questions? Director uh, Poshin, do you have any questions? I don't have any questions, but again, this is something that's uh, way overdue and uh, I fully support it. Thank you. Director Potts. Not at this time. Thank you. All right. Um, I think this is awesome that we're doing all this stuff and we're able to uh, use ESSER funding for it. I just hope that we figure out another funding source in like six years when we need to renew all of these things that we've been doing. Um, oh, you already are working on it? That's part of our plan is to bring curriculum adoption every single year, a chunk of money built into our budget out of the general fund. Not any categorical funds, none of the soft monies that we're talking about. So we will have that when we do our five-year projection. Awesome, thank and you. Just a little bit to that. You'll notice these ones are six here. The last time I was here, it was eight and 10. So we are trying to spread them out like Kevin was saying. I like that. Then it's not all coming at once, but then if you go too far out, they're way outdated. Mm -hmm. um, I think this is awesome. I'm glad that we're able to do these exploratories in the, or not the elementary, the intermediate, the junior highs and high schools and really build those pathways. So awesome stuff. Is there any other information board members would need before you see this as voting on at the next regular meeting? Great presentation. Thank you very much. All right, the next subject for discussion is subject 10.05, District Communication Plan. Turn it over to Superintendent.
for everyone watching at home. We need a minute to get everything working right now. Tim, do you have that document to pull up, please? No, I think it's okay. Thank you. Um, this th this discussion item is in a result of uh, Vice President uh, Klein Jerome's request to see what it would look like to bring our communication department back inside. Um, and so we currently are are utilizing the services from TAG. Ivy's going to bring up our presentation. I forwarded this presentation to you. On the first slide of this, I wanted to bring up what are some of the current uh, services that TAG is, is providing to us. And um, hold on one second. We seem to be having trouble communicating our communication plan. Yeah, I apologize, Director Potts. Maybe I'm, just, <laughs> I'm <just> joking. <laughs> hey, we're going to take a uh, quick five minute break while they get everything worked out, and then we will be right back. Thank you. This is the Mountain Dew break, right? <laughs> you know it.
All right, we are back and we'll uh, continue on with the discussion. 10.05 District Communication Plan. Again, I'll turn it over to the superintendent. Thank you for solving our problems, Tim and Ivy. Thank you very much. So our current... Hmm. There we go. Thank you. So our current reality is we are uh, under contract service with TAG. Can you scroll down, Ivy, please? Thank you. Um, <clears throat> I've linked the, the, the contract in there, as many of you have seen on the previous board documents. Um, but to highlight some of the, some of the points that TAG, uh, uh, the services that TAG provides for us is they're our social media manager. They, web, they, they manage our website. In terms of communication, they do a wider range, a, a wide array of things for us, crisis management, media releases, and any proactive branding that comes. We have an email that goes directly to TAG. They gather the content and they filter that content throughout the community, in, including our media. That contract for TAG is 150,900 annually, and we set aside, we budget about $30,000 a year for videos and things that we create. So our fiscal year of 20, I went back two years finances for, for uh, our contracts with TAG for our actuals. And so again, we have our action plan and our video and photos that varies every year. So we spent, um, you can see the dollars associated at a total of 100, 180246 over uh, the 21-22 school year. For the 22-23 school, school year that we are in, uh, you can see that we are, our numbers are very similar. Um, our videos and photos are down a little bit. Our website costs are down, but as you can see, we're still incurring costs that will be paid. So this number will be a little bit higher. So the, the request, uh, the board request is like, what would it look like if we brought this in house? So went back and looked at what the board had before we moved external and, and to what we are, where we are now. And so previously we had a program director of community re relations and communications and we had a, a form of a content creator and i think a district our size is always going to need a professional service contract whether or not we are uh, purchasing working on our websites ad campaigns things of that nature uh, videos created advertisements we're, we're always going to need that in our a district our size the in the in-house model we would create a new department utilizing new positions listed above and other community-based positions currently in place. So we have uh, members inside of our district that are strictly working with community um, and, and, and working with partners. So if we were to bring that in-house, that's probably the route we would go, which is similar to what it was before. Um, so an estimated annual budget, and again, this is an estimated, an estimation. We can go any direction, any information that the board would like to see. But that level of, of expertise would probably be around a program director and administrator. So the current costs of, uh, uh, of an administrator of that caliber, you can see there. And a content creator, we, we, when we priced that out and looked inside of our system, would probably fall in that lane. And we would again move forward with a budget or contracted service of about $30,000 annually, which would give us the price of $308,000 a year. And so that kind of brings us to our discussion or before we move forward with that, does anybody have any questions with how we arrived at where we are or, or any other considerations? Director Beck. Um, can you explain what professional service contract means? Yes. Yeah, so. So for example, we would need to create videos, we would need to do commercials, we need to purchase um, just basically anything to do with an ad campaign or branding or some, any, anything along those services. And so a district our size, we feel like we're always gonna need that service moving forward. So, so budgeting for it is, is incredibly important. But is it, is it a person, is it stuff? Like, no, it, it would be a service. Okay. And, and it could be some stuff too. Okay. Um, you know, uh, promotional materials, but mainly it would be the creation of videos, running an ad campaign, okay. putting together a, hey, we have an issue we're trying to solve, or hey, this, here's a really exciting thing that we're doing. Please uh, please help us put, put, uh, 
put some brand on it. So. And so they would work with a content creator. Is that how that works? So the this department would work closely with that outside agency to help put something together, for example, a commercial. So if okay. we wanted to create a commercial, we wouldn't right. have the capability of doing that inside our own district. So then we would move forward with that radio ad, things of that right. nature to help us okay. provide that. And then my other question along those lines was, um, do they do the website then too? So this department would do, well, we're always going to have some external help with our website. Yeah. But our own uh, internal people would take control of that website. Because right now we, we email tag, they put something on the website, and that's how that works now. So that would fall on this newly formed department. Discussion? Um, hang on one sec. Director Poshin, do you have any uh, questions or discussion? Uh, yes. Um, so I'm just looking at the comparison of a cost. We've got quite a difference in comparison of costs. Um, and then also, <clears throat> I'd be interested in looking back on how we were doing this previously. And we went to TAG for a reason. Um, and is there other other companies that we could look at instead of just uh, comparing uh, in-house with the school district and, and, and just with TAG? Did you have anything else, Director Postion? No, that was it. Okay, Director Potts. Yeah, I this doesn't this doesn't include any um, office help, any secretarial services. Am I correct? Correct. And this doesn't include office space and uh, the cost of the square footage of office space and all that sort of thing. Correct. Correct. The office space we would have here at J.B. Young. So my recollection of years when we, most of my career was in-house, there was a lot of turnover in the, in the people in that area. And oft times individuals in that area were skimmed off when there was a shortage of personnel someplace else in the central office, like answering the switchboard or filling in because uh, somebody was out on maternity leave and things of that nature. Also, if my memory serves me, it was also one of the first places we would go and reduce when we had some budget constraints because it wasn't a line service, it was a support service. That's just food for thought. To answer your previous question off the top of my head, which I can get us better information, during our first round of reductions, I think it was 2018, 19, or 1920, we were roughly spending uh, an estimate of about $500,000 on this department. Because to your, to your credit, uh, Director Potts, we had an administrative assistant, a content creator, a um, a um, program director in that spot, and a budget, um, probably similar to the budget and contracted service that you see there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And to be honest, I, I didn't think we got a lot of bang for the buck under that structure. Did you have anything else, Director Potts? No, that's all. Thank you. Uh, Director Barnes. Just a couple of quick uh, questions, and I, and I suppose an observation. I, I worry that this um, doesn't accomplish what we're actually trying to accomplish, and I, I wonder um, if, the, if TAG has been adequately charged with what the district's priorities are. Um, I, I worry about a high paid administrator who may not be a doer and what we um, likely need is more 
doing, uh, you know, making news, making good news, getting the story out there. And, and so I just have some concerns about this structure and it not being enough. Um, and my communications team for a much smaller organization is 12 people. Um, and we're suggesting you know, really two people to, to try to communicate on behalf of the entire district. I wonder if there is a, a conversation to be had with TAG about what our priorities are as a district. Director Kleindro. Um, one thing that when we interviewed for the board position that you got and you and another person said, we need to get the positive news out there and that's alarming to me that we are apparently not reaching people. Um, if they do not have internet, putting all this stuff on Facebook, who cares? They aren't following it, they aren't seeing it. Um, we are doing a lot of good things. We bring people in front of us as a board, we recognize them, we're happy with what's gone on. Um, but if you're not watching this, again, you don't have the internet, or you don't have Facebook, you aren't seeing this. Um, it's not getting covered, it's not getting out to people. I was at a meeting with TJ and at this um, outside um, committee, they said, well, what are you doing and getting kids ready if they need to go to work? And TJ's like, well, what? well, we have all the CTE program and he pulled out the brochure, they had no idea. So there's a huge disconnect. We're not getting this information out to community groups, to taxpayers that don't have kids in school anymore. So uh, there's a fail somewhere there that we are not getting to people. I don't know if it needs to be a quarterly news letter or something, but we are not doing a good job. Yeah, I, I appreciate that. And I would just say that I, I think that um, if I were to characterize this, our communication strategy probably is not strategic. It's very utilitarian. I mean, we're emailing tag and saying uh, format this so that we can send it out rather than thinking about th those points uh, precisely. Director Beck. Um, I think actually those are a couple of good points. Um, one thing that I've uh, expressed concerns about, or I've heard concerns about um, so I sit on the LCAC, which is our local school improvement advisory committee. Um, <clears throat> and that is made up of community members who uh, are interested and invested. And um, uh, complaints about how the website is formatted come up a lot and the fact that it's not particularly user friendly. Um, and I know those are some things that I have brought up as a board member. Um, but whether they're being communicated to our PR people or not, I don't know. That's, that's not my job to talk to them directly. Um, but so I agree that there's something, there's something missing there. And whether it's because we haven't adequately shared that with TAG or whether it's a service that we need to be looking elsewhere for, I don't know the answer right now, um, but definitely something's not working. There have been a lot of, I hear a lot of complaints about the website um, from members of the public. So we have, to answer the website question, TAG will only fix what we send them. We have, we have hired a, uh, a temp at will, Evan Moser. He is going down the list of all complaints about the website and he's working through fixing them this summer. So reducing the size, making the phone font a little bit different, and all of those recommendations are being generated to be fixed for the start of the next school year. Mosher's a good man. He sure is. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I thought you were going for your mic. I was going to call you. Director back. I guess my other question would be, I don't remember if we did an RFP when we hired TAG. Um, 
And they did a fantastic job with rebranding, helping us, you know, the logo, all sorts of things are, you know, a thousand times better than they were. But I just wonder, you know, at what point do we do a, do a reevaluation, right? Most of our contracts, we sit and we reevaluate after a certain period of time and decide if we're getting what we expected out of it or, or if it's time to look into other options. So I think for me, that's the kind of the point of this discussion. Is it time for us to reevaluate or do we, uh, you know, give it a little bit more time or what, what are we gonna do right now? Mr. President. Director Potts. Yeah, in, in line with what Director Beck just said, I think maybe it's time that we as a board decide what direction we wanna take our, our public affairs people in and what we want them to now focus on. Because we spent the last couple of years focusing on branding, getting ourselves at a, at a Dutch with the State Board of Ed, you know, changing our website, changing our image. And maybe it's now it's time for us as the board to sit down and decide, okay, what's, what's the next focus for our public relations campaigns? You know, we've always talked about, we need to highlight what we do well. We know we do so many things well. Maybe now's the time to move from establishing, looking at the last few years with TAG is now we have this baseline. Now let's spring off of that into more focused uh, public relations in terms of the attributes of our district and the things that we do so well. Thank you for that. I feel a workshop coming on. That's what I was just going to, I was actually going to bring. I knew you me. would. I knew you would. <laughs> That'd be a great committee of the whole discussion. If Brenda's listening, please add that to our agenda committee tomorrow. Right. <laughs> we'll make sure we get that on the agenda committee planning, Bruce. Um, is there any other discussion on this? Director Potts, did you have anything else? Or, uh, yeah, Director Potts and then. No, I've, I've done enough damage. Okay. Director Postion? No, I. I agree with Bruce. I think he, he he nailed it on you know what we need to do as a board. Um, and again, I think maybe if we have some more options and if we sit down at a committee of a whole meeting and look at those options and then uh, come up with a plan. Perfect, thank you. Anyone else? Um, my two cents, I would like to see what other districts our size spend on this stuff because I think that is ridiculously low for as big of a district as we are um, and I agree the website is not very user friendly so that would be nice to do that but again if that stuff's not being uh, expressed on what all we need I think our social media presence has really went down hill there's not a lot of stuff out there getting that stuff out there um, and I know there's different theories out there all the time but you see a lot of people post all the time and then they stay relevant and stay in the algorithm all the time. Um, we've really lacked in that area a lot for the past bit. Um, but it is nice we do always have coverage, even though they're disruptive in the back and a little noisy sometimes. Um, a little disrespectful when you're running a meeting. I don't appreciate that stuff, but it is what it is. Uh, I, I did a little research, um, but almost everyone I ever talked to, the biggest thing, we don't tell enough about the things that we offer in Davenport. And my personal opinion, that is one of the main areas of focus for our workshop that we need to talk about how we're going to get that stuff out there because it's going to be highly competitive now with how many was it like a ton of the education savings accounts applicants and things like that so we're gonna definitely have to compete with that um we just have to up our ante and you know promote all the things that we do i mean we have a lot of great people i'm always in favor of bringing things back in-house because then you can control them a little better and i do agree with uh, what director potts has said i think when it was done before i don't think like along the line with a lot of things, I don't think it was implemented with fidelity and correctly. 
Um, but I think we're on an upward trajectory with a lot of the things that we're doing now that we're able to uh, curb that stuff and roll things out the right way with fidelity. Got it in twice. Um, but I think this would be a great uh, committee of the whole discussion and then the board can kind of sit down and establish kind of like we did the stuff for LGAC. So um, I see a lot coming from this, but I, for myself, I would like to know the, say the staffing numbers how, and the positions that some of the other districts have, what their budget is and maybe some of the, obviously you're gonna have to like go to a ways away so we're not competing with them, but so we can kind of get a, uh, an idea on that stuff. Cause I think, I mean, I think even the 500,000 was a little low for how big our district is, but I'd be curious to see. But I think whatever direction we as the board decide to go for the district, we have to implement it the correct way and um, put the correct things in place to make that work. I mean, one of the benefits I see from that is we could offload some of the folks that maybe the ILDs oversee or whoever oversees them and then they would be over that person or underneath of that person in a different department so it, it would alleviate some uh, things from those people's workloads. Director Beck. Um, I guess I would ask that we make this a uh, committee of the whole sooner than later um, uh, because it is something that is clearly really important to all of us. Um, and then um, I would also, I know the LCAC is on hiatus for the summer, but um, if you think that this is something, you know, what do they think would be helpful in getting information out, um, that might be something that we can do our first meeting on. Um, so I, I would uh, suggest that might be the, a good kickoff topic. Thank you. Um, what I'm gonna do real quick, I'm gonna go around the horn and ask each board member some uh, information you would like going into this uh, committee of the whole discussion or maybe a topic you would like to see so we kind of get an idea and I'll start with uh, Director uh, Poshton. Well, like I said before, Dan, I'd just like to see some more options and see what's, uh, what's available out there. And you could probably put together like a list of different groups and stuff for a potential RFP. Perfect. Uh, Director Potts. I think it's in, our, in this committee of the whole meeting, I think we need to focus on the specific areas we want to target for enlightening the public and or enlightening service groups, enlightening uh, the American Legion, you know, getting our people out into those communities, into those those like rotary, getting people out there to tell, hey, this is what we're doing here. This is what we're doing there. I think we as as a as a board, we sit down and we decide, okay, this area, this area, you know, because you can't you can't do a hundred things well. Pick three or four and focus on those. Absolutely, I like that cast in the net. Um, Director Barnes. Well, I, I hope in the discussion on the committee of the whole, we, we can take a look at what, what we'd like to accomplish. You know, what is our strategic communication plan? I, I think that that precedes any type of an RFP, uh, trying to find any partner or bring things in-house. What, what is it that we want to accomplish? Who are the stakeholders we want to influence? Um, what, what's the big idea? Uh, one would think that even with a partner like TAG, if we had been clear about what our strategic objectives were, what our strategic communication goals were, we'd be at a point right now saying, hey, you haven't perhaps lived up to those expectations. So let's be clear. Let's try to find out what our strategic objectives are. And, and then it will be much easier to choose a partner or determine whether or not it's beneficial to bring it in house um, because this is clearly a, an issue. So that, that's what I'd like to, 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 to think a little bit about. Director Klein Jerome. Um, I, and I would like to have a discussion about not only what do we want the public to know, but how do we get that information out to them? Um, because even going to these service groups, that's, yes, they have constituents, they, but that's not gonna hit everybody that I think we need to know what we're doing here. 
um, you know, we have an older population in Davenport. How do, we, how do we reach these people and let them know what we are doing and doing well? Uh, Director Hayes. I think we need to begin with communication. Communication is a beautiful thing when used appropriately. And we need to have a sit down with TAG to see if there's something that we're omitting to give them. Um, I think we need to give them a chance to voice, you know, why are we not doing this? I also agree with the communication because older people are not on social media every day. And how do we disseminate that information? to everyone. Director Beck. Um, I think uh, aside from what's been mentioned, I would want to know um, <clears throat> some statistics about uh, student achievement, participation in extracurriculars, things like that that we can share out to the public. Um, what are our AP credit scores? What are, uh, you know, how, what percentage of our graduates go to out of state university? I don't know. I can't, I, you know, there's a whole bunch of things that people want to know when they're choosing a district to move into. Um, the kinds of things that you would ask a realtor, for example, if you were uh, choosing a house, right? Um, you know, what percentage of our students participate in band and music programs and art programs and sports and those kinds of things, um, I think would be important to know. Uh, so we know what we can, some of the things that, those are things that don't change that frequently, right? You know, they don't vary that much year to year. So it would be a good idea to have those on hand, I think, as part of what we want to share. Um, but then I agree with how do we reach the people who, because really some people are gonna go to Davenport schools because that's where they live. Um, and when we're talking about getting the good news out, we wanna make sure that we are letting the people who can choose, choose to come here, right? I choose to come here. So what are the things that, what are the reasons people choose to come here already? I think that would be something that we need to know or would be helpful to know. Because then we can share that. You better get out a whole nother, you want, would you like to add into this? No, this is very helpful. Um, I really like the idea of, you know, where where we've been, where are we, and where are we going? That is always a relevant thing to stop and pause and ask yourself. And so that's the number one thing. And what are we trying to get out of this area? Um, and so I think that'll be a wonderful discussion that will we'll help direct us in exactly what it is that we want um, to accomplish. And so uh, I, I, can, I, I can definitely see that developing into a really great discussion at a committee of all the October 7th cow is filling up um, so for me I, I agree with what director Potts said I think we need to narrow it down to like three things because when we focus on specific areas we're able to get things done um, I also uh, agree with what director Barnes said I think that we need to get all of our stuff figured out. And I also agree about the RFP or whether we do it in-house, but we need to figure out what we want first. So then we get, this is exactly what we want. So when we put it out, everyone knows this is what we're looking for. This is, you know, the direction we're trying to go. And then, the, I mean, it's just the same as what we do when we give the superintendent or they give presentation, hey, this is what the board would like to see. So we can kind of give the marching orders to, to work on that. Um, I, I agree with what Director Hayes had said, maybe have a set down with TAG, you know, where um, we can go over things and then we'll know where, you know, where uh, the issues lie with why stuff's not getting done this way or that way, whether it's a communication thing or whatever. Um, but I think 
one of the main things is we have to fill the gaps because when there are voids, people fill it with whatever they want. It makes for great articles. Um, but uh, we have to be able to, you know, when people say Davenport schools is because of this, da, da, don't send your kid there. Well, why not? Because we have all of these amazing things and testimonials from all these kids and, um, you know, your dual enrollment programs. And we got 19 career pathways. There's no one else around that can compete with us on that. So we just have to get better. At, uh, we have to be better as a board to give that clear direction to the superintendent to put that stuff out and for the uh, administrative team to work up something for an RFP eventually. But I think we need to um, get to that point where we can establish these are the three things that we all agree on where we need to go. And maybe that's something where we ask for some feedback from uh, the community too, because uh, they're our best uh, assets too. And maybe it's a poll or something like that or something send an email out to families or something and kind of get their uh, thoughts on it too because I mean we have done a lot of things in the past couple years and um, it's it's never ending and the foot's always on the gas and we're always getting better all the time so I think uh, when we can get some of those issues uh, addressed and taken care of and then doing the things we need to do we fill those voids so they're not just sitting empty for people to fill them up with whatever they want Director Beck. Um, I know I mentioned statistics. I think the more important thing is some ideas on why people choose to go here. And we may come up with those reasons, but that I think is important basis for a discussion because that's ultimately what we want everyone to know. Why, do you, why should you choose here, right? As opposed to there, there, wherever. Um, and that so if it, if it ends up being, you know, maybe we don't need statistics, but if we do, you know, how many of our students are employed after finishing one of our CTE programs and, you know, or have a job offer upon graduation? Like those are important things to know too. Um, and so, uh, yeah, but for me, it, all the things that we've been talking about are important and also why, why do people choose here? Thank you, and to figure out a way to reach everybody. But for the record, I do want to clarify. My grandma uses Facebook and Instagram, and <laughs> she's in her 80s, so thank you. Everyone's got their different speed on what they do. I just wanted to throw that out there for you. All right. Um, Director Klein's room. Um, and even to the point, like, I've gone to some great musicals in these high schools. But does the community know that's going on? I, I don't think so. And like to get them into our building, go, go to Central and see that beautiful auditorium that's been built or North High and West High and go to the band spectacular. It is spectacular, but if they don't know about it, they aren't there. I mean, their tax dollars go to these buildings. Get them into those buildings to see what's going on. Um, a choir concert, uh, whatever is going on out there. But if they don't know about it, they aren't there. I believe we got plenty of information to plan for this uh, October cow. <laughs> is it October or August? August. Oh, I was going to say, yeah. Sorry, August. I did say October earlier. You did. August you had me messed cow. up there for a minute. I thought I missed the month. Um, so we will look at uh, getting that planned. I think we're doing an agenda committee tomorrow. All right, we will move on to administrative reports. No, that's fine. I do have one. <laughs> so um, one of the things that Ivy has been working on is putting together a web store uh, for, for our district. Um, that way somebody outside of our district can purchase swag from any one of our schools. And we're gonna pilot that with the school board to see how the ordering and the processing goes. So a request from uh, President Goza has been, maybe the school board should have matching shirts for different things that we do. So we're gonna work on that first, see how it, how it goes, and then we're gonna work on moving that out to the district.
Although I would go for a nice shirt like that in the back. That we'll put it in the store. I like the blue. It really pops. All right. Board requests. Are there any board requests? Uh, seeing none, board reflections. We will start with uh, Director Potts. I would say it, it's it's the thing that I reflect upon I find the most long range positive thing we're setting up here is our plans on curriculum adoptions and staggering those adoptions so that we have certainty in the future that we'll be able to maintain up to date curriculum resources for our students and our teachers taking advantage of this ESSER money, this windfall, is allowing us to set up that timeline to purchase new curriculum like we've never purchased before. And I really think that has long-term significance on, on the, uh, the experience that our kids are gonna have in our schools, elementary through high school, core curriculum through extracurricular, um, and, I, and I, I don't think we can underestimate the long-term impact that the decisions we've made in that regard are going to have. Thank you, Director Potts. Uh, Director Poshin. I agree 100% with Bruce. Um, uh, well said, Bruce. Um, but the other thing I'd like to bring up to, again, the recognition to uh, Jabari Woods, um, uh, again, a shout out to him and uh, a thank you to um, what he's done for the district. And then also, I would like to extend a welcome to our new board member um, and thank you for uh, stepping up to the plate and uh, accepting the position. Thank you, Director Poshin. We told him he has to be Kent, too. <laughs> um, Director Beck. Uh, the two that I was going to mention were the great strides we've made in curriculum adoption and um, how lucky we are to have Jabari Woods um, as part of our team. And uh, I would also add um, the fact that we have had an update that all of the compensatory education that we were cited to uh, and required to do has been completed. And that is uh, really important. And that now we're operating on our own. Thank you, Director Beck. Uh, Director Hayes. I agree with everything that's been said thus far. And my um, additional option was the compensatory. With that, it's been a long time coming to get all those hours completed. And I'm happy to hear that we are past done with phase two now. Thank you, Director Hayes. Director Barnes. Well, first, thank you for making me feel very welcome. I'm glad to be of service to the students in this district, the faculty and staff, and to all stakeholders. And the second thing, um, it is incredibly refreshing to have presentations that are three slides, five slides, and seven slides. Um, so I just want to uh, compliment the administration uh, for tight presentations. That is incredibly welcome. Thank you, Director Barnes. Don't ever watch an AEA board meeting then. <laughs> <laughs> Director Klein, Jerome. Um, when at one point we had 323 students that were owed additional education, um, and now we're down to 11 this summer and 10 in the fall, um, and it, we have come a long way, so that's outstanding. Um, the curriculum, um, I'm glad to see we're updating a whole lot of curriculum from someone who taught high school language arts with a taped together book so that it wasn't falling apart on students. It's about time some of this got updated, so that's great. Thank you, Director Klein, Jerome. Superintendent Schneckwell. Probably the most exciting thing for me is that over the last three years, we've really head down feet forward, moving, don't stop. 
and our cabinet always talks about let's stop and look up at the horizon what's coming next and if you look at a lot of the conversations we had now it's okay let's get a cycle going okay kevin puts in how are we going to pay for it and, and we're beginning to have these horizon conversations even the component about our communications inside let's look up what is it that we want what are, what are the goals that we want to have and then let's decide so I think that those conversations are a great sign all throughout our board meeting that we're beginning to look up and have horizon thinking. Oh, yeah, I thought the timer was on. <laughs> Thank, you. Shutting us off on that. <laughs> Thank you, Superintendent Schneckloff. Um, again, congratulations to Jabari Woods. That was an awesome presentation. He's a huge asset to Davenport Schools. Greatly appreciate him. Um, and I agree with everything that's been said. I am excited that with all these new curriculum adoptions and how we're able to start things in the junior high and then move it up, we're really starting to get to the junior high model uh, to get the exploratories out there. So I'm very excited to see that. I'm, it sucks we had to go through a pandemic to get that money, but I'm glad we had that money and we're able to do that. And I'm glad that things are getting spread out. So. Um, you don't have to do tape together textbooks. Um, and I'm glad that we can have these great discussions on these things. And at the end of the day, we're all here for the success of the students and the better achievement for all the kiddos in our district. So all of these things that we've talked about tonight are going to be huge assets to them. So um, with that, Director Potts, I would entertain a motion to adjourn. So move. Is there a second? All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed, same sign. Ayes have it. Motion carries. Meeting adjourned. <laughs>